Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience 2020 Fantasy Football Week 1 Rankings Update. Injuries and some projected DraftKings ownership. You want to jump to any part of this? Just hit the time codes in the description of the podcast or video and boom. It's easy enough. Smash the like button for the episode and in the comment section, you tell me your biggest injury concern. Which player concerns you the most? Whether they're out or whether they could be out or whether they're kind of banged up or limited or whatever in week one. Because some guys are playing in later games and you have to factor that in too. FTNDaily.com. If you use code Mayo, you can check out the Pat Mayo live subscriber chat show, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time every single Friday night. Plus, you get, with this subscription and the discount when you use code Mayo, you get the projections, you get the lineup optimizer, the lineup generator, everything you could want in terms of tools if you're serious about winning on DraftKings this year. Again, FTNDaily.com. Code Mayo gets you access to all of that. And if you screenshot your purchase to me by next Tuesday, uh, you're going to be in the draw to get one for free. Get your money back and you'll get the subscription for the entire NFL season. This is going to be a regular thing for me on Friday evenings after the injury reports have been released that I'm going to go through my rankings. I'm going to update them and let you know rapid fire style what is going on in the NFL as it pertains to injuries and what you really need to be concerned about going into the weekend. Because, you know, there's some guys like, for example, Jarvis Landry. He could be on a snap count. If they get down by a bunch, he might get pulled from the game. He might get the Brandon Cooks treatment from Thursday night. That wouldn't be great if you were thinking about starting Jarvis Landry. So I'm going to try to hit on every pertinent name. You can find all the rest of the content, by the way, whether it's the DraftKings picks, the spread show, the rankings list, the DraftKings cheat sheet, that is all in the description of this video and podcast. You want to book a cameo for Pat Mayo so I can shit talk your league mates? You can find that down in the description as well. It's all down there. Shockingly enough, if you check the description every single week, then you're going to find everything you need to find. The only thing that won't be there, because it hasn't happened yet, live, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Sunday, on Mayo Media Network, on the YouTube channel and the Facebook page, facebook.com slash the PME. Myself and Brad Evans are going to be live for an hour updating you on everything before kickoff on Sunday. And maybe, just maybe, taking some of your questions. So you're going to want to subscribe to that for the live video if you do want to ask a question. Or you can catch it on demand on the Pat Mayo Experience audio feed after the fact, if you want to go to the gym in the morning, take the dog for a walk in the morning, it's going to be up there for two hours before kickoff on Apple Podcasts and wherever you get your podcast. If you just want to catch the show then, I highly recommend that everyone go download it anyway, even if you don't listen, because that helps out the show immensely. U.S. Open next week, too. I've already released the first look show. I will have DraftKings picks. I'll release that after lock for NFL on Sunday. Probably don't want to watch it on Sunday because you want to be watching football. Feinberg and I will be back on Monday. Monday afternoon or Monday evening to do the betting preview live chat next Wednesday at noon Eastern time. If you're concerned or if you want to get into golf, if you're not, if you're here for football, you tell me to fuck off. This is why you hit the time codes and just jump to what you need to know. All right. Rankings all updated on DKPlaybook.com as of this recording. And they will update again Saturday and Sunday morning after I finish that show with Brad. That will be the final update when the actives and inactives are released. Injuries for week one that we're paying attention to at the running back position. We're going to go position by position here, and it's going to be, here's the first one, and this isn't really an injury, it's more of a note. There's going to be news and notes along with this too. The Seahawks, at least according to Pete Carroll, are going to use the quote, old hot hand approach between Chris Carson, who had been dealing with an injury coming off that hip surgery in the offseason, and Carlos Hyde, Rashad Penny is going to be out. I don't know what's going to happen to DJ Wiki Wiki. Dallas, maybe he's in there. I don't know. We'll have to see how that plays out. I did bump down Chris Carson in the rankings a little bit. We've always heard this conjecture about Chris Carson, regardless of the year. And it always just turns into if Chris Carson is healthy, he gets the ball a bunch. I just worry about the health ramifications of this. Because let's face it, talent-wise, Chris Carson is better than Carlos Hyde. And I'm not suggesting that you go out and use Carlos Hyde, but it could take away from the overall upside of Chris Carson if this does devolve into a 60-40 type split. I don't want that if I have Chris Carson. I'm probably still playing him anyway. But I initially had him up towards an RB1. Now he's in a middle pack of running back twos. Miles Sanders and his hamstring injury is questionable for week one against Washington, and even if he's active, they may manage his snaps. Again, I've dropped Miles Sanders from an elite play 
this week down into the bottom part of the top 10. I think I have him at number 10 overall for the week one running backs. I'm still going to play. I mean, you went out and drafted Miles Sanders for this, unless a lot changes in terms of coach speak or some sort of report on Sunday morning. I think you're still good to go with Miles Sanders, but we really wanted the 80% split between him and the rest, whether it's going to be Clement, probably going to be Boston Scott. But if they're up in this game, I would expect to see... 65-35 in favor of Sanders, and that could be good enough, although Washington's defense is highly underrated. I actually like them as a DraftKings play at the min price 2,000 this week, because that front seven's pretty nasty, but better against the pass than they are against the run, so maybe if Miles Sanders, and this is just a way to throw off the scent, that it might hurt his DraftKings ownership as well, so it's something to really look into. If you drafted Miles Sanders, you're going to start him unless critical news comes out that you shouldn't. David Montgomery and his groin injury appeared at the beginning of the week like he wasn't going to play, as Jake and I brought up on our week one ranking show, but that was a week ago now. It looks like he will be playing after back-to-back days of practice. I bumped down to Rick Cohen, added in David Montgomery, and we all had these high hopes for Cordero Patterson to come in and just be slotted in at running back. Maybe you get some catches out of him when he lines up at receiver. Probably not going to see a whole bunch of Cordero Patterson anymore. I have both Cohen and Montgomery ranked outside the top 30 for half point PPR rankings as running backs in week one. I don't know who to trust in this game. It just seems like one of those things where if there was no Montgomery, you play Cohen, you might get 20 touches out of him and where he does so much in the receiving game, that's so valuable. But now that Montgomery is going to be back, even if he's just slightly above limited and doesn't even look like he's going to be limited at this point, then you're going to get like 15 to 18 carries for Montgomery three for Cohen, and you hope to backdoor into some catches, it does not make him a very good play whatsoever. I've been lining up to use him on DraftKings because there's no really cheap running back that I trust. But if Montgomery was gone, I would use Cohen. That made a lot of logical sense. But if Montgomery's going to be there, it's not the safest of plays anymore. So I'm thinking him off the list. Tevin Coleman has been said by Kyle Shanahan to have a choice to play in week one. Uh, He suffers from... Uh, a sickle cell trait, and with all of the wildfires currently going on in Northern California, that the oxygen level may not be up to snuff for him if he's not feeling it uh, in week one. So just straight up, do not play Tevin Coleman uh, unless other reports come out that maybe you should. Uh, It doesn't sound like it's going to be that way. Plus, that is in the late set of games, so if you were using Coleman, uh, you're not going to have a ton of options. I would actually probably guess Jarek may get more run than Coleman, but other than that, this probably means great things for the usage of old Colonel Mostart. I have actually moved him up in the rankings. I had him at 21. I believe he's up to 19 right now. Uh, He could get upwards of 80% of the snaps in this game. I'd say that's the very high end for him. I wouldn't bank on that. But we never know how the San Francisco backfield is going to go. At least for week one, it does look like Mostart is going to be the guy. And if he's the guy in that offense who's already dealing with a bunch of injuries at the receivers, that Mostart's a really good play against Arizona. So just fire him up. Don't worry about it. His over under in the prop market is 56 and a half rushing errors too over over on that even if Coleman ends up playing I would expect him to be severely limited once again pointing to an uptick in usage at least in week one for Colonel Mostart Daryl Henderson in his hamstring has been called by Sean McVay good to go week one against the Cowboys again that is a Sunday night game I have bumped down Cam Akers. Malcolm Brown was already going to be in the mix. They've already talked about having a three-headed backfield. For me, I would project it to go Akers, Henderson, and then Malcolm Brown. I don't know how the receiving game is going to be divvied up. I don't know how the goal line is going to be divvied up. And before I can know that, I'm not going to place that much faith in Akers. I like Akers long-term for the year. And initially, when Henderson was out, I had him inside my top 20, but I had to bump him down. There's just too much risk involved here. I don't know about the snap share, the touches, the quality of touches. It's just It's all unknown at this moment. If you want to gamble, it's the best gamble of the Rams running backs. That doesn't mean it's great by any means, especially if Dallas's offense, they're favored on the road. I actually like the Rams in that game. But either way, you know that Dallas is likely going to score points in this contest. If that's the case, and all of a sudden Akers isn't the pass catching back and the Rams fall behind by like 10 points, then he's just not going to see the field. So the rankings have to account for the downside that can come with some of these plays too. So I bumped him down. Jags OC Jay Gruden confirmed that James Robinson will start week one and and handle the workload. Or sorry, he, quote, can handle the workload. That's good to know. I don't think he's going to be a three bet down back. I did bump him up above Chris Thompson for the week, although I basically have them back to back in the very low 20s. Ozigbo has been placed on IR. Raquel Armstead has been placed on IR. These are the two guys that the Jags are rolling with. Now, they're eight-point dogs. 
against the Colts. They figure to be trailing for much of this game. I still think that leans Chris Thompson, but that's basically all passing game work. Robinson, I think, will be mixed into the passing game from time to time, and he might end up with like 10 to 12 touches on the ground too, at least early in the game to see if he can get himself going. But he's probably going to be primarily their goal line back if they can even get close to the goal line. So he's not a great play, but he does have a significant amount of upside if he turns out to be a three down guy. Again, I don't think that's going to be the case. That's why I have him ranked lowly. I wouldn't go after him on DraftKings, despite him having a really nice price. I think he's going to be chalky, along with Chris Thompson. Probably just best to avoid pay up at running back this week. That's really the solution. Pay down at defense, pay down at quarterback, pay down at tight end, and figure out the rest in the coming weeks once we get a better sense of what these snap shares are going to be. I think both are capable flex plays, Thompson and Rob- Robinson, in your season long. But there's probably better receivers that you can insert into your flex because you should have better running backs at this point. Uh, DeAndre Swift for the Lions is likely to play. So now they're going to go with Carrion, Adrian Peterson, and Swift. Stay away from this backfield until you can figure out what's going on. And the fun part is, with Matt Patricia, you never know what's going to go on, so just don't invest in the Lions backfield. Let's move over to wide receiver where there is a lot of news on the go. Kenny Galladay is doubtful for week one against the Bears. He's probably not going to play with a hamstring injury. Danny Amendola, also questionable. He's likely to play, but replacing... Kenny Galladay on the outside. We're looking at Marvin Hall and Quintez Seifer. Cephas. Seifer. I just hope he doesn't play. So actually, not anyone with the name Q, I'm just kind of in on. But Marvin Hall's actually super interesting, both on DraftKings. You're probably not going to pick him up in your season-long league. There's just you, If you don't have better options than Marvin Hall to replace Kenny Galladay, I, I pray for your team. But on DraftKings, super cheap. And Marvin Hall averaged over 35 yards per catch last year. He is a pure speed deep option. So Marvin Jones, I've bumped up in the rankings, obviously. Hawkinson, he's now 100% health. I've moved him up in the rankings. But Marvin Hall, if you need like a punt play on DraftKings, a deep play threat who can get, a, who can get you all the way there and pay off his price on one play, I don't hate that if he's announced as the starter. We're not going to know that until Sunday morning, but either way, he is someone you should definitely be keeping on your radar as a way. Like, I don't like any of the pay down options at receiver. That could be one I could buy into because I do kind of like this game indoors. I think it's going to be higher scoring than people think. Mike Evans and his hamstring problem, doubtful for week one against the Saints. That's going to move. Don't know exactly how they're going to set it up. But that might move Godwin from the inside to the outside and have Scotty Miller play the slot. Or it might just keep Godwin in the slot, move Scotty Miller and Justin Watson to the outside. I don't love Miller or Watson. I prefer Miller over Watson. I think he's the better receiver at this point. Uh, But I just don't know how this offense is going to roll. I think it is the smartest move by the Bucs to keep Chris Godwin on the inside, away from Marshawn Lattimore and the safeties out there. So that will give him room to patrol. And that's just where he was so good last year is out of the slot. That's where Brady likes to throw throw to that makes the most logical sense outside of Godwin and maybe Fournette if you have to I don't like anyone on the Bucks in week one again I think that if you if you have a better lean than I do go with your gut and play these guys but I, I think you're asking for trouble here in this game where we just don't know where the ball is going to go we don't know how this offense is going to look we don't know the running back rotation we don't know the wide receiver rotation the one thing that we do know is Chris Godwin is awesome he sets up well with Brady he should be really good other than that complete crapshoot. And it's a late game too. So maybe if you're way behind and you think that Scotty Miller has a bunch of upside, you can slot him in and shoot for the moon with that kind of thing. But for me, I'm just not going that route. The Jets, over oh, the Jumbo Jets and their, their conga line over the Bills, according to Tim Andercast, will be without Mimsy Denzel Mims, week one. He injured his other hamstring. He might go on IR. So he is not playing week one. Brashad Perriman was cleared uh, to, let's see, Brashad Perriman was cleared from the team's injury report. He's going to play. Don't like him on the outside, matched up with Tredavious White. This is a Jamison Crowder game or potentially Chris Herndon game with short catches over the middle. That's what you're looking for here. I'm not playing Perriman. I do like Crowder this week, though. Julio Jones was limited at Friday's practice with the hamstring injury. Something to monitor. Doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. Same as Nikhil Harry with his shoulder injury. Uh, He's questionable for week one of the Dolphins, although reports are that he is going to play. Uh, If not, fire up Coco Beware, the Birdman, Demir Bird. He's just a speedster on the outside who has a connection with Cam Newton in the past, and he might get some special teams work as well. He's very fast 
on the outside. Was in Carolina, Arizona last season, now in New England. Just could be another cog in this new offense that we're seeing from the Patriots. The Dolphins, uh, Devontae Parker and his hamstring injury will play week one against New England. This is, I think, is actually better news for Preston Williams. Because if, if Parker doesn't play, Williams probably gets matched up against Gilmore. Now it's going to be Gilmore on Parker, allowing Preston Williams, everyone's favorite play from like the first five weeks last year, to actually get some run. and may have some room to maneuver on the outside. So I like Williams a little bit. Wouldn't be super pumped to be playing Devontae Parker, who has been banged up and draws a terrible matchup. Jarvis Landry said his week one playing time will be dependent on the Browns game plan. Now, the Browns secondary is decimated. Both their top corners are going to be out for this game. We know they're already banged up on the defensive line. It just might be open season for the Ravens to go deep. So I did bump up Hollywood Brown a little bit and even Boykin a little bit too. Andrews was already going to be high, but that could pose a problem for Jarvis Landry simply because if they do fall behind by a lot, He's already likely to be limited with this hip, but they might just pull him from the game if they feel like they're already out of it. So I bumped up Odell just a little bit, um, but I just don't love this Browns offense in general. If they're going to do well against the Ravens, it's going to be with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt and running the ball as often as possible and maybe try to break one with Odell. It's going to suck when Landry goes out and just post numbers all over them, but I'm you know, I'm like, I'm a coward in week one. I want to take the guy who's probably going to be limited. That's just me though. Maybe you want more than that. Raiders at Panthers, Brian Edwards, who's you know kind of a darling this week was listed on the week one injury report with a knee injury. However, he practiced in full. He's good to go. Alshon Jeffrey for the Eagles. He's out of here out for week one on Jalen Ragor in his shoulder was going to miss four weeks. As of like four days ago, he practiced in full. He's off the injury report. He's playing. Week one, I don't think I'd be like fired up to go play Ragor, but it's nice to see him on the field in full health. It is a nice matchup a little bit against the Washington footballs. And when we get to the DraftKings ownership part of this show, Deshaun Jackson is shaping up to be one of the highest owned guys this week at receiver, might even be the highest owned. But I do think Ragor being back does take away from him just a little bit. Expect those tight ends to go off too, both Ertz and Goddard. A lot of 12 formation coming from Philly here. And against that defensive line, they're going to be needed to block as well. Ragor just might run free, run free on the outside. They did draft him for a reason in the first round to get him the ball. Bump down uh, Arcega Whiteside and Greg Ward too. Chargers Mike Williams is questionable for week one against the Bengals. I'd be happy if he was healthy, but that is in the later set of games. So if you're waiting for Mike Williams, you need an alternative plan in case he doesn't play. And frankly, what do you expect out of Mike Williams anyway? You hope to, we don't know how he's going to mesh with Tyrod. I like his prospects for the season, but dealing with this AC joint, I don't even know if he's going to play. Probably not the spot to play him in week one. Cortland Sutton injured his shoulder in practice on Thursday, did not practice on Friday. He's lean and doubtful for week one. Um, and KJ Hamler is already dealing with an injury. That means Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton may get into the game to replace Cortland Sutton opposed to Doug Judy, Jerry Judy, if we, if we want to call him by his real name. Love Judy in this matchup against the Titans. But with Sutton, if you're waiting for him, you got to have other plans. This is the late Monday night game. By the time you're going to know whether he's going to play or not, if it's not announced on Saturday or Sunday. I mean, if it's not, it's not going to be announced on Sunday before the one o'clock slate starts. So you're not going to know. I would just make other options and not play Cortland Sutton. Uh, don't wait for him. I've taken him out of the rankings. I don't think he's going to play. If he plays, you know what? And he sits on your bench and he goes off. At least you know he's healthy. That's always good news, but you don't want a zero in a late game and you have to play like Tim Patrick in that spot instead. So just a hard pass on that one. Corey Davis from that same game, the late Monday night game is dealing with a hamstring injury. He was limited at practice. Uh, just don't play Corey Davis. Good news for Janu. Janu Vision, and obviously for A.J. Brown, to funnel more market share of targets towards their direction. Brendan Ayuk for the 49ers, and his hamstring is slated to play against Arizona on Sunday. Debo Samuel is out. Uh, Steelers Deontay Johnson in his foot injury practiced on full on Friday fire him up don't worry about him on Monday night against the Giants he should be good to go ESPN's reporting that Golden Tate has hurt his hamstring and does not feel like he is 100% I bumped him down in the rankings moved up Shepard moved up Slayton and Ingram is going to stay where he is wouldn't play Tate unless he gets a full practice on Saturday because again that is the Monday night game do Monday night games you're not going to have a whole lot to move off of and to pivot to and once again if you have guys in later games whether it is on DraftKings or even your season-long fantasy football team if you have three receivers and one of them is playing either Sunday evening or on Monday put that guy into your flex if that was going to be one of your flex options 
questions, just so it gives you a greater idea that you can be flexible in that spot. That's what the flex is for, that you don't want to be locked into a wide receiver or a running back when you could have just played them in your flex, depending on what you used in your flex. So if that person is declared out or limited or something comes up over the weekend or at practice, that you had just have more malleability in order to put someone new into that spot so you don't take a zero. Always remember these little tricks of the trade. It doesn't happen every week. It may not even happen during the course of a season, but if it happened once and it saves your ass and you get a win, well worth paying the extra six seconds of attention to. All right. Uh, last wide receiver note, the Cardinals wide receiver, Keyshawn Johnson, not the one on TV, the one who plays for the Cardinals, was placed on the team's reserve slash COVID-19 list. It has not been reported as of this recording whether he has tested positive for COVID or he has came into contact with someone who has. He wasn't probably going to play anyway, but keep an eye on these other Cardinals receivers. If he has tested positive, he's been practicing around them all week, that all of a sudden, like you could have a wide receiving core wiped out. We don't know how this is going to play out because we have not seen it yet but i'm throwing that out on the radar right now is pay attention to these cardinals receivers now it's primarily larry fitzgerald and christian kirk but it could affect kyler murray it could affect Kenyon drake i don't know how this is going to play out hopefully it's nothing but it's something to keep on your radar if you're invested in those guys just in case all of a sudden last second that's a late game too on saturday fortunately i think we would know before that if there was a major wipeout because the nfl does want to set a precedent of how this is going to work moving forward tight ends uh there's not really much ado about tight ends the only one really you have heard it in his chest he seems fine. Uh, Ian Thomas in his foot. He seems fine. The one that did pop up was Seahawks tight end Will Disley. Walt Disley, inventor of Mickey Mouse. He was limited with an Achilles problem in Thursday's practice, although it does appear like he is going to play. DraftKings ownership for the week. If we are going to take a look and pivot off some of the chalk, what I am seeing right now, and again, this is a Friday evening. This can always change with some of the injury reports and people galvanize behind one name later in the week and they become super chalk. But at running back, it looks like it's going to be Christian McCaffrey and Josh Jacobs as the two highest owned. I'm probably not going to use any Jacobs. And it's really hard to fit Christian McCaffrey into your lineup. Elliot, Chris, and I talked about it on my DraftKings show, which you should go like and watch and listen to up on Mayo Media Network or the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. Rate it five stars. It's pretty good. Or even if you don't think it's very good, rate it five stars anyway. Help me the fuck out, all right? Not going to play Jacobs. McCaffrey, he's just so expensive. Even Dalvin Cook, it looks like if you're not using McCaffrey, the next logical option is going to be Dalvin Cook just because he's so much cheaper, but he too is still expensive. I do think with this Miles Sanders news, his ownership is going to be slashed a little bit. That could be the spot to go. I'm going with Kenyon Drake. Probably Todd Gurley in the low $6,000 area, even up to Joe Mixon in the mid-sixes, just because I want to be able to afford some stud guys at every position. I talked about, I just don't have a lot of trust in some of these splits. You're going to get right, like, if you have a big lean on, like, Merlin Mack is someone I'm really looking at, for example. I think that he's going to start over. Jonathan Taylor. I uh, just, that's the way that the reports are coming out. And, but, you know, by the time Taylor actually takes over, it could be like week four, week 10, doesn't matter what it is. But I don't have a whole lot of faith that, you know, I don't have the conviction that Mac is going to be the guy. But if you can give me a 65, 70% snap share at a Mac, he's cheaper. So I'm more willing to gamble on something like that in a few lineups, just because I think you can run all over the Jags. He's killed Jacksonville in the past. Running backs just killed Jacksonville in general. And their defense significantly worse. Like with that Gardner Minshew. To DJ Chark, Chark stack that I'm playing this week, I might bring it back with Marlon Mack in certain spots because I'm not completely convinced. At running back, I do just want to pay up for the guys that I know that are going to play. And most of those guys are above $6,000. And if you do take Cook or you do take McCaffrey, you probably have to drop below that threshold at $6,000 for all of your running backs. And I just don't want to play that game. Um, but I'll try to figure out a way to get McCaffrey in a few because he's fucking fantastic. At the low end, it does appear like Antonio Gibson's going to be chalky. James Robinson and Chris Thompson are probably the other two that people are going to gravitate towards. At receiver, uh, Devontae Adams. Adams and Deshaun Jackson factor and Michael Thomas appear like they're going to be the three highest owned score in McLaurin, my guy uh, at 5,600. It's a good price. So people are probably going to use him as well. Although the matchup against Slay might bump him down a little bit. The other one, I would guess Chris Godwin is going to carry substantial ownership as well with this Mike Evans news coming out uh, at the low end. No one really, no one likes a pay down receiver. Like I had mentioned, uh, Paris Campbell is someone that if you want to buy into the Colts slot, he could be the number two guy that he's going to get all these snaps. I just prefer Jack Doyle in that circumstance as the pay down option at tight end. If I'm going to take a piece of the Colts offense, but Marvin Hall, 
Hall could end up being the guy for me, at least, especially if I do end up uh, game stacking the Lions and Bears just a little bit. So the targets are going to funnel somewhere. They got to. And maybe Marvin Hall downfield is the perfect recipe for that. Tight end Hayden Hurst and George Kittle shaping up to be the two high-owned ones. Zach Ertz as well. I would guess Hawkinson is now going to get up to double-digit, close to double-digit ownership in the DraftKings main slate solely because of this Kenny Galladay injury. For me, uh, I would just pivot off of Ertz and go to Goddard. I think they're all things being equal, that they have the same touchdown upside. And that's all I'm really looking for out of tight end. If not then, like I said, Jack Doyle or Ian Thomas are the pay-down options for me. Granted, Thomas has to play, but it looks like he's trending in that direction. And these are guys that are going to be like 5% or less owned who have the same sort of... A, I actually think Doyle has substantial upside here, both from a floor and touchdown perspective. I really like Jack Doyle this week. At quarterback, it's flat pricing across the board. We might not even get one guy who cracks 10% ownership. Matt Ryan, Lamar, Cam Newton, probably going to be your three highest owned, but that could really go either way. Wouldn't worry anything about ownership as it pertains to quarterback this week. Trubisky will be somewhat highly owned. Uh, I'm disappointed to hear that because I really wanted to fire him up, and I probably will anyway. For me at quarterback, in terms of picks, Trubisky, game stack, it's a really logical one with Allen Robinson and Anthony Miller, and then you can bring it back with either Marv Hawkinson or Hull if you want to save them bucks. But I like Minshew. I like Chark. Pair those guys together. Maybe add in Chris Thompson if you really want to save all the money. I'm probably not going to do that. But if you want to go from the other side of the coin, maybe it's T.Y. Hilton. Maybe it's Jack Doyle. Maybe it's Marlon Mack. You have different options if you want to mix and max if you're playing up to 20% or 20 lineups, which I probably will this week. I'll play in some of the 20 maxes. Not in the Millionaire Maker on the main slate. Just, you know, Millionaire Maker's not really for me. I'll make my one lineup, play it in singles and three max and it'll probably be a Minshew and Shark stack for me there. But if I do want to bring it back, when I start mass multi-entering, it's probably going to be with those three guys from the Colts that I talked about. Maybe Paris Campbell too, potentially just to save a little bit of cash. What I'm going to be doing is using the FTN daily tools. They have their optimizer. Uh, if you didn't catch my show with Havi and Kyle Murray, it's up on Mayo Media Network right now. They talk through how to pick the proper tournaments for you and how much you want to spend and how many lineups you're building. That's an essential tool to being profitable on DraftKings in every sport, but especially NFL, because there are some really good flat payout contests like the Pat Mayo Experience, Listeners League. You can find the link to the description of this video and podcast. It's almost full, but you might still get a spot, $15 to play. There's no rake, three max entry. Gives a chance to almost everyone out there. So I recommend you come play against me. Take my money. You know that I'm using Minshew and Shark, so you can just go the other way and kill me. Take all my money in that contest. But if you're serious about playing five or more, you should really go to ftndaily.com, use code Mayo for the discount, get your hands on that optimizer in lineup builder. You can correlate your stacks, your game stacks, and just make everything so much easier for yourself uh, that if you're going to play more than, fuck, $25 a week on DraftKings, I highly suggest you go do this. It will give you a chance to actually make some money this year. Uh, so ftndaily.com, code Mayo to go check all of that out. There's tutorials up there too, but it's very intuitive to make your lineups. Uh, you won't have a problem doing it. Uh, finally, at defense, the Colts are where people are going. They're the only one I can see pushing double digits. I'll just fade the Colts. I like the Chargers or Niners if you want to pay up. But I think most of my lineups will either have the Vikings defense with a banged up Packers off defensive line and additions to an already top five adjusted sack rate defensive line in the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. Give me some of that at home, 2,500 bucks. Let's go. Also the Washington footballs, the bear men, $2,000, the Eagles offensive line, not having all of their players switching people around. They got guys opting out. You guys already on the injury report and put adding chase young to that defensive line, which was already top 10 adjusted sack rate. Pretty good. People are underrating Washington's defense this year. I like them a lot. Carson Wentz, not a stranger to sacks. Not whatsoever. He might go light it up, but I am not concerned about that at the defense position. I just want Carson Wentz dropping back 40 times in this game and allowing the Washington D-line to go after him. He might put up 300 yards and three touchdowns. Not a concern because that's probably five sacks in that time, more pressures, and hopefully some fumbles, some picks to keep that game going. Washington's D, $2,000 on DraftKings. Let's go. That was the rankings update and injury report for week one. I'll be back Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern, live with Brad Evans, taking your questions and doing the final update. You can find my rankings list in the description. You can find all of the shows in the description. Smash the like on your way out. Rate and review the Pat Mayo Experience. Five stars, audio version. 
Thanks for being with me. I hope this was rapid fire enough for you on a Friday evening or Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon or whenever it is you choose to watch this. Go back, subscribe to Mayo Media Network on YouTube because the more subs we have, the more content I can put out for you. And maybe not even from me, because we're going to have Monday Showdown uh, from Justin Freeman, who just won, split the Millionaire Maker on the Thursday night opener. He's going to be doing an exclusive video for the Monday night DraftKings Showdown contest. That will be out on Sunday. David Jones will be doing the Thursday game. That will be out on Wednesday. So there's going to be more videos, football-related, not featuring me. Please go support those ones and Mayo Media Network. It's been a really fun week one. I'll see you Sunday. I'm Pat Mayo. Good luck this week. Family experience! Experience!